Welcome. I'm Stacy Hinton, and I'm the OYAP consultant with Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board. OYAP stands for the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, and I'm joined tonight by Elaine McLaughlin from Simcoe County District School Board, where she is the OYAP coordinator. <clears throat> Welcome to you turn your co-op into an apprenticeship. And we're lucky to have on the panel with us tonight, Brian Westerman, who is from Brian's Little Electric, who is an excellent OYAP mentor, who hires many, many OYAP students after they graduate. And as well on the panel, we have Kareem uh, Blake Green, who is going to share his apprenticeship journey to the trades. He is an, electric, an electrician's apprentice. Uh, also joining us tonight, but they won't be seen, are our chat champions. We have Wade Tower, who is with Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board, former OYAP consultant, and Justin Van Diepen, who is our co-op and SHSM lead with the Simcoe County District School Board. And I want, I want to apologize, Kareem. I think I said your name wrong there. It's Kareem Green Blake. So welcome, Panna. So tonight we're going to talk about how you can turn your co-op into an apprenticeship. So please uh, join us tonight if your child is currently enrolled in a co-op program if they're going to be taking a co-op in their semester two timetable, or if they have plans to take co-op in a coming year. So co-op is an elective for students in grades 11 and 12 and sometimes grade 10, it stands for cooperative education. And it's where students leave the school for part of the school day or all of the school day to get a work placement experience. If your child knows already that they want to be an apprentice, if they've always been someone who likes to build, make and shake things up, then the skilled trades co-op placement is the ideal recommendation. Uh, some pro tips for success in your skilled trades co-op is to introduce yourself to your co-op department quickly if you haven't done so already. And you can absolutely do that before the semester begins. Um, our co-op teachers in the school boards have really, really strong community relationships. They have lots of experience. So really they are your in-house resource if you are wanting to pursue an apprenticeship while you are in high school. As well, I would strongly recommend that you be very clear in the choice of skilled trades that you would like to pursue. Uh, if you don't know yet, there's still time, so do your research. In Ontario, there's over 144 skilled trades opportunities that can be turned into apprenticeships, and you can find those out just by doing a very quick Google search. As well, I would strongly recommend that you call employers early to see if you can secure a work placement for your semester in co-op. Uh, specific trades like electrical are very competitive, so it's a really good idea to be proactive, to phone up a potential employer, to introduce yourself, and to see if you can come on in for a co-op interview. And that brings me to how you can ace the interview. I would strongly recommend that you always be prepared. Arrive early, look sharp, and put your best foot forward. Do your research as well. Find out about the company to which you are applying. What do they do? What do they build? What was their latest great project? Uh, and if I can give you some advice that would have come in really handy for myself, it's always a really good idea to have a question in your back pocket that you would like to ask of a potential employer. Sometimes they will say to you, do you have any questions for us? So absolutely, you want to have something at the ready that will let your potential employer know that you've done your research, you want to be here, and you're prepared to work. Uh, always smile. It's really, really important to come across as being very confident and to know who you are and what your strengths are. Our co-op employers don't necessarily expect you to have any experience, but what they do expect is that you have a very, very positive attitude, you're there to learn, and you come across as very, very confident. And finally, always bring your professional portfolio. It is never too young for you to start building your professional portfolio. And if you have any pictures of projects or if you have any examples, you can bring your phone. It's a really, really good idea during that interview time for you to be able to say to a potential employer, this is something that I have done. Let them know that you're serious about the trades and that you are planning on pursuing this as an apprenticeship opportunity. Co-op is an opportunity for you to develop your own professionalism. And by that, we mean you definitely want to practice strong communication skills in the workplace. When you are working with adults, the expectation is that you present and you speak to them as adults. So if they do not prefer to be text, uh, to communicate by text rather, then have those conversations. Just walk down the hallway, let them know what your intentions are, if there's anything that they need. Uh, the other thing that you can do during co-op is you can actually get some training that will really help you in a skilled trades apprenticeship, and you can certainly include that in your portfolio as well. Your Working at Heights training is arranged through the school boards, uh, and that is valid for three years' time. 
You always have to do your women's training before we would ever let you go out to a work placement. And as well, there is COVID awareness as well as young worker awareness. Once you are hired by your co-op employer, that means that you now have a place for you to go for two periods or four periods of your high school timetable semester. So once you've had a few months on the job and you have absolutely shown them your shine, you have demonstrated that you are hungry to learn and that you have the skills for the trade, uh, and you can show them that through your attention to health and safety, to maintaining a clean and respectful workspace, to asking strong questions, uh, showing them that you can handle new tasks, uh, tasks rather. At that time, I would have a conversation with your co-op teacher and find out if an OYAP apprenticeship is possible. Because if it is, those co-op teachers can help you have that conversation with your potential employer, and that helps to get the ball rolling. Another great piece of advice that I wish that I had uh, known and had shared with my co-op students long time ago is, if you are in an environment where there are other apprentices, most definitely speak to the other apprentices on the floor. Find out how their journey went. Where did they go to trade school? How did they come into this apprenticeship? Uh, what are their greatest challenges? And how did they overcome them? What would they recommend to a young person who is coming up in the skilled trades? And again, always maintain very strong communication with your co-op teacher. That's very, very important. Without fail, every student who has come to one of my co-op classes who has a strong sense of who they are, of the skills that they want to acquire, of the co-op placement that they would like to work in, without question, those students always soar when it comes to evaluation time. So once you've had that conversation with your potential employer, and of course they will say yes, because you have demonstrated such strong work habits, um, and you're going to be awesome, then you can speak to them about your being signed to an apprenticeship. And that means that you can then use your co-op hours towards your on-the-job training. So one co-op credit is approximately 100 hours of uh, out-of-class time where you are learning your trade. Uh, if we use the electrician as an example, there are 9,000 on-the-job training hours that are required for you to become a tradesperson in that particular skilled trade, you can use those co-op hours to come off of that 9,000. And more often than not, I have had skilled trade students who in grade 11 take a two period co-op in the summertime, they get another summer co-op credit for one or two. And then by the time they're ready to graduate in grade 12, they've had another four period co-op. That's a total of 800 hours that can come off of that 9,000 that's required for the on-the-job training. So that's how you can turn your, your co-op rather into an apprenticeship. The skilled trades are hiring. They are incredibly rewarding. Uh, and I can't recommend enough. I like to call them the best kept secret in employment. And I would strongly encourage any young person who wants to enjoy their work, to be physically active, who enjoys problem solving and has the ability to think in 3D, likes to communicate and work on a team, explore the skilled trades. They are hiring and they are certainly ready to go. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Elaine McLaughlin and she's gonna start with the interviews with the panel. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, so, so far tonight, you've heard quite a bit about, you've heard the word apprenticeship and you've heard the word employer. And what I want to do is just focus for a second on something that you're not hearing and you're not hearing about applying online. So if you were thinking of going to straight to college for a full-time program or university after high school, you would be turn, um, typing up the certain websites that you wanted on your computer and you would be uploading documents that are required and you push send and you wait to hear back, that sort of thing. But when it comes to apprenticeship, the apprenticeship program is owned by employers. So in Ontario, employers are not one great big, huge unified group. They are individual companies, just like we'll hear about tonight. And they are using the apprenticeship program to fulfill their staffing needs and, and get staff trained. It is for them a way that they get their staff trained. So you um, are required, therefore, to impress an employer. It's, it's done uh, one, one at a time. And we'll be hearing tonight about how, how to do that, some uh, tips from, from experts themselves. Uh, tonight, uh, just to focus a little more on our panel now, and thank you so much for coming. Um, Brian Westerman is um, a journey person, electrician, as uh, Stacy mentioned. Would you tell us a little bit about your company? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm the owner of Brian's Little Electric. 
I'm an electrical contractor in Barrie. Um, we have about 21 field staff and uh, two office staff. Um, and we do a wide range of electrical work from you know, residential service calls right up to high rise residential, um, retirement homes, um, fire alarm jobs. We do a wide range of electrical work in, in and around Simcoe County. Um, and we have a wide range of apprentices from first term to fifth term. And we brought a, a few pictures, just a few quick pictures to give you an idea of the type of work that uh, Brian's Little Electric does. So the first picture coming up on the screen is uh, Meridian Place. And when Brian was working on this project, he was good enough to invite construction classes to come and see the project when it was still a lot of mud and just in the early stages. What was that project like? So that was a really interesting project. It was a lot of um, site work. So underground conduits, a lot of underground electrical work um, because it is a park or uh, like a park um, with the um, stage setting there. So it had uh, stage lighting and, and a lot of underground works for power pedestals and so forth. And it really was kind of a pride point just because it's right in the heart of Barrie, which is where our office is based out of. So I walk by that uh, job site all the time. So it's kind of satisfactory to see no, we built that, we built that, uh, or we did the electrical for that project, which is always nice to see when, when you're driving around as a tradesperson to, to see all the jobs that you've done. And that's one that I see regularly. And it's really a historical site too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the next one that we have is, um, is a residence. And it's a pretty spectacular look, looking residence. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, so that was... Uh, uh, a very intricate home with a lot of specialty items in there, specialty lighting um, that you don't see every day in, in uh, most homes. So there was uh, in-floor lighting that, that uh, lit up walls. There was uh, staircase lighting. There was uh, outdoor lighting pathways. There was an elevator in it. There was backup generator. Um, it had a really large service for residents. So it was a really interesting project because it was unique. It was uh, quite special. Um, with a lot of uh, special attributes to it. So that was a really interesting project as well. Is there something more that you expect of your apprentices when they're working in a residence? Um, so if it's an existing residence, it's, you obviously have to be a lot more careful, a lot more tidy, and um, a lot more, you just got to be extra special care when you're, when you're in someone's home. So those are some of the special, more special attributes you need when you're working in a home. And the third project that we brought is um, that we brought a picture of the FedEx project. Yeah, so that's an, another project that we worked on recently. Um, so it's open now. It's an industrial facility um, that has a lot of conveyor systems, controls, a lot of conduit work, a lot of wire pulling. So it's a, a totally, not totally different, but it's a different uh, type of project than you would say in a residence. Um, so there was a lot of learning there. There's special conduit needed for, for that facility as well. So it's a very interesting project and intricate as well. Were you the only electrical uh, contractor on the job? So we weren't the only electrical contractor. There was a, a base building uh, contractor that did the uh, base building work. We were specialized in the conveyor system. So we did all the electrical for the conveyor systems. Um, so we needed to do conduit and control wiring and uh, sensors, a lot of, a lot of, specialty work um, for those conveyor systems to function properly. Um, but yeah, there were other electrical contractors on there doing the base building uh, type of work. Okay, your competitors. Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, everybody has to work. Okay. So Kareem, um, you, when did you graduate from high school? Um, I graduated from high school in 2020. Yeah, and then I went back to high school to for 2021 to do uh, grade 13 to do another co-op afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. And did you have an idea for a while that you wanted to get into skilled trades? At first it wasn't actually just skilled trades at first. It was, I was gonna be a teacher. I, in grade 11, I was gonna, I was going to do co-op for, to be a teacher. Then I was gonna go to school to be a teacher. And I believe I did it in grade 12 again. And then afterwards, when I went back for grade 13 and I did co-op again, I realized I didn't want to be a teacher as soon as I started like getting back into the trades. And um, what, did, what did you, would you say that 
it was that made you successful on your co-op so that it turned into an apprenticeship? Honestly, mm, it was more the fact just like looking at what I could do instead of what I have done and seeing that I could be like do trades and actually push myself to do it every single day and like wanting to do it that was the big thing for me like being a teacher like yeah it's fun I loved it I loved the kids too but working trades was way better just like right off the gut. What were some of the biggest challenges in the early days in co-op? For electrical? For electrical, yes. Mm, the challenges probably were, honestly, it's probably just trying to wake up at first. And then once you're actually up, then you're just up, you're gone. But after that, like once you actually get to work and you start working, like it's just, it's, it's fun, it's especially being around the people that you are every, every single day. And then, you know, nobody treats you like a child when you're on a job site, like just because you are a child, you're not a child and you got to learn how to grow up really fast. And it's fun. It's, it's honestly really fun. Um, how did, I have often heard it said that the office hires and the shop fires. So you had to somehow win over your coworkers as well, not just the boss. Oh yeah. Right, would you say? That was a funny one. That was, um, my big one was to try and work as hard as I possibly could, but make every single person, like every single person on my whole company like me. And I don't think I've had one bad comment. If, if you could ask Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for him. I haven't heard a bad thing about him. So he's been successful in his goals. That's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, for like, just try to be friends with everyone. Because once you have one bad person that just doesn't like you, then it's just not the same. It's not the, it's not the same feeling. Changes sense. Oh yeah, for sure. Brian, are there things that you do as an employer to, to, to retain employees? Is there anything special you do? Yeah, so or? that's a big topic nowadays to keep your staff and, and uh, keep them retained and engaged in, in their work. Um, because a lot of people look at things greener on the other side. So you got to make sure your grass is pretty green. So, um, you know, we just do, do little things, you know, we cooperate with our staff. Um, we help them with, with situations, uh, scheduling sometimes, you know, people all have commitments and personal lives that sometimes, you know, take priority over, over work life. So, you know, we have to understand that, um, and, and cooperate with our staff. Um, we work four day work weeks. Um, which really benefits our staff. Our staff mm. really enjoys that, having long weekends every weekend. Um, we can't guarantee that, obviously, but we do our best. Um, and also letting our staff take ownership um, of, their, of their jobs and their careers, particularly our foremen, especially. Um, you know, if you can work four-day weeks, go ahead. If you can keep the customer happy, why not? Um, you know, sometimes they got to come in late because they have appointments in the morning. Um, you know, we have special events for all our staff. Um, you know, during COVID has been a little bit challenging, but uh, typically we like to have uh, special events, get everybody together. So um, it's taken some time, but we have a really uh, good group, uh, a good good group in, in our company and we all get along and we all have fun together. So as Kareem's alluded to, they, they have fun on site, but they also work really hard. So it's a win-win. I'd like to talk more about the co-op from your perspective. Um, do all co-op students come in ahead of time to get to know you or how do co-op students approach you? So typically I get a call, usually their first week of co-op when they're supposed to, to find their placements. And uh, so I get bombarded with, with, with co-op placements all, all looking. Um, but neat little story, just this week, uh, I had a co-op um, that's starting in February and he uh, reached out in November saying, I'm looking for my co-op placement. I have a co-op uh, in February and I'd like to get into the electrical trade. And that really piqued my interest because I was like, this, that's a first, nobody's reached out that early. It's usually the first week of co-op they reach out. Um, so we lined up an interview this week and uh, yeah, he's coming to start in February um, for co-op placement. Um, he had some, some good, points on his resume as well like he's worked uh, before so that was handy but really it sparked my interest that he came this early 
Um, so that was really good. But a good good communication skills really sets sets a lot of co-op students apart when they have when they have that uh, skill set. Um, it just makes them more engaging and and just wanting to train. And how does someone demonstrate their good communication skills? Um, so this co-op did it via email, but um, also in the interview when you you know ask questions, they, they you can kind of see the the interest and in, in the fire in them that they you know they really want to get into the trades. They show that eagerness, um, so that's really important. That they uh, what I always tell a lot of um, co-op students is what's going to set you apart from the other five people ask like looking to get a co-op placement in electrical as an example. Well, go find out something about electrical. What do you like? So then when you're in that interview and you show, hey, I did my research, I learned uh, there's residential, there's 309A, I want to get 309. So just something to set you apart um, that you've shown that interest because everybody wants to work with or train or, or show uh, somebody that's interested. And if you can show that interest in the interview, um, that's, how you, that's how you're successful at it. And how many minutes in the interview does it take you to make a decision? you're going to bring someone in or send them away so i've um, learned over the years not to be too hasty in the decision making because then you make mistakes um you know you can make a decision in three minutes but it could just be a bad three minutes um in the interview right so you really got to just you know hold your 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 uh thoughts till till the end and really evaluate the the uh, the interviewee um at the end because they might just be really nervous and really not sure of themselves. And then um, I have certain questions in my interview that kind of puts them at ease. I kind of have personal conversations with them during it so they can, um, you know, put down those, those nerves because, you know, they're all young and they're nervous. Obviously, it's probably one of their first interviews. So we try and break through that and, and really get to who they are or get a little more information of who they are so then we can really evaluate them better. Speaking of people being young in high school, we appreciate that you've looked to our high schools for your hiring. Yeah, it's, it's critical. We, we are short on skilled trades, uh, electricians especially. So um, like I can't find electricians just looking for work because most of them are all working. So we have to train within. So we have to you know really groom our apprentices and train them um, within and the best ways to, to find them are, are when they're in high school. Um, it really helps uh, for them to get a career path and it helps us get to the to the labor force that we we desperately need. Thank you. Kareem, do you remember your first interview? Were you nervous or how did you um, what did you think about as you went into your first interview with Brian? For my first for, sorry, for my first uh, interview, I I was kind of nervous like before I walked in. And then when I walked in, I sat down, I was just like don't be nervous, just do it. And then I did it. I just talked, just talked as if it was just me and him just sitting there just having a conversation. And then after that, he told me that I got the job for my co-op and then went home. I was ready for the work next Monday. And I think I was supposed to start like two weeks after, but he was like, come to the shop. Like I got something for you. And so I went to the shop right after that, like on the Monday instead of the two weeks. And speaking of the shop, you've got something very special at your shop. What, what, what do you have at the shop for that helps you learn the job? So my first Monday there, he brought me into the shop. I had no idea what I was doing. And he was like, hey, you're going to build these panels and you're going to build plugs and on these panels. So I had there was like one journeyman that came in. You put the boards together. And then Brian came in and he showed me how to do one. And he was like, okay, now put eight of them on there. And I was like, okay. So I put eight of them on there. And I went back to him and I told him, okay, I'm done. And then he came and he looked at them. He's like, they're not, uh, the inside's not like all cleaned up properly. You got to redo it. So I was like, okay, I can do this again. So I did it again. Then I did it perfect. Then he was like, okay, now make another one. And then I sat there for like almost two weeks. And I was making, I made like, I think six or seven of them in two weeks and then he was like okay hey, you're ready to go out now so he just he sat there and he showed me how to do everything he showed me everything in the shop he made me take pictures made like maybe do homework when i got home all like and he would come in every single day when he saw me and he was always like 
what's what color is uh, 34 or something. And then I'd have to sit there and I'd think about it and then eventually got it. And so that was like, that was, that's how I learned everything. Like just sitting there, him sitting there with me doing it. That's, that's how I learned for sure. Then when I went out there, it was the best. It was just easy. So why did you decide to start training uh, using, um, setting up a, a situation in the shop where people could learn first? So I was, so I've taken off on many co-ops over, over the years and, you know, before uh, Kareem came on, I was brainstorming, like, how could, how could I improve the co-op program or what could I do to make it better for, for our co-op students, but also for, for the company before he goes out to the field, how can I improve things? So I was just thinking, you know, uh, just brainstorming. And I thought, you know what, there's, why don't we create a board? I got, I got all the material to do it. And it's like a training board. So it shows how the service comes into the house through a meter. Then you put a panel, how the plugs go on, um, how to do the light switch, how to, so then at the end, you could plug this board in and, you know, see the plugs work and click the light switches and you see lights turn on and, and so on and so forth. So it's a good training board um, that we created. It was, you know, nothing astounding, but it's just making the time to show them uh, and, and doing it and getting them to understand the different materials, how elect, electrical works, because I don't know their background and how much do they really know coming out of high school about electricity and the materials. So this was a good way to understand the materials that's required on our jobs. So we created that board and he did that for, for a week um, and got that one sorted out. And then I also, I've had used this before, but questions. So I have like test questions. So they have to figure out, find out what, how much amperage can a number 12 wire hold or how much wires can go in a pipe. So they have to research all these items and that's some of the homework. And I also got them to do homework, like where, what kind of panel do you have at home? And what's on a, what's breakers your stove on? So you'd have to go home and you'd have to look it up and find it. So it's some homework to kind of get them engaged and really thinking about, um, about electrical and then see if they're really interested. And uh, yeah, so I got them to work in the shop and do all these, these things and test questions and homework and, and so forth. So, you know, when they're interested, they go and find those answers, right? Like when they're interested, they, you know, I'm going to show, I can figure this out. You know, when they can't answer any of the questions, then, you know, they're really not, this isn't the, the trade for them or they're not as interested. So, we should probably also talk about co-ops that don't go well. What are some things that make a co-op not go well? Um, so one of the big things that makes them not go well is communication. So if they don't communicate with their coworkers well and, and really get them to, cause they've got to sell them on training them, right? Like if they're not interested, they don't show that they care. They don't, uh, show up on time is, is one part of it, or, you know, miss work. Like we treat our co-ops, you know, as an, as an employee, because I'm not going to treat them any different because if they do become an employee, then the then the standard has now been changed, right? The benchmark to, to the expectation is changing. So that's not fair to them. And it's not fair to the company, right? You don't want to work with somebody that's late all the time because you have to be on time. So you say, keep the same uh, expectations um, from just a punctuality and interest perspective, not necessarily productive mm -hmm. uh, because that's obviously going to be different, but they got to show up on time and just like any other uh, employee. And then they got to be excited, interested. And then all my journeymen want to train them, right? So the more interested they are, the more training they're going to get, the more experience they're going to get. If they're not interested or don't show that same interest, they're not going to get to learn a lot. They're going to be doing the more mundane stuff continuously rather than some of the engaging uh, activities. So Kareem's always been very um, energetic and, and, and a happy, outgoing person. So everybody wants to work with them. So then if everyone wants to work with them, they always want to train them. Well, let me show you how to do this, Kareem. And then he gets that kind of added uh, benefit from that, uh, from that uh, attitude. I've heard it said, if uh, a journey person tries to show you something that you already know, you should just say thank you. Oh yeah, I say thank you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you don't want that to ever stop, right? Yep. Right. Do we have any questions coming in from 
from the audience. I'm not sure about that as yet. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to touch on, and both of you mentioned it, Kareem, yeah. you talked about how much you enjoyed being challenged. Yeah. Yes, you are a young person, but you were treated as an adult. And yeah. certainly you, Brian, talked about the fact that there are some expectations. You are getting along with my other employees. And I think that that's really, really important. I'm not sure um, that all co-op placements have that opportunity. And I really think that that really shows a great deal of trust. And yeah. it's the, the more I learn about skilled trades apprenticeships, I really realize how very valuable that mentor and mentee relationship is. And I think that's excellent. Set the bar very, very high uh, because our young people always rise to the bar if it's set very, very high and they enjoy that. And I mean, you talked about the fire, right? I can see the smile on your face and how much you're actually enjoying the work that you're doing. And that says to me that you have found exactly what it is oh, yeah. that you want to do. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. That is a beautiful thing. Um, in terms of apprenticeship and how it is that you log hours. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because as Elaine mentioned uh, in the beginning, um, it's not the same you know, centralized process to, to become an apprentice as it is to say, have a, a college or a university application. So with an apprenticeship, the expectation is that the apprentice keeps track of their hours. Yeah. Um, Brian, so I'm going to I'm going to speak to you, Kareem, and find out how it is that you do that. And then I would I would ask you, Brian, if there's anything that the employers can do to kind of help and mentor with that, because that is pretty important. You need 9000 hours to be recognized um, mm -hmm. as an electrician. So how does that work for me? I so I know exactly how much hours I always have because I always check my pay stubs. And OK, so, it's so pay stubs. yeah. And so every paycheck, like every paycheck I get when it shows my hours on it, I would add it to the hours I already have okay. every single week. And so it would just accumulate every single, like So higher, you higher personally week. keep strong yeah. bookkeeping? Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And can I ask Brian, do you let the apprentices take that over entirely or do you also aid in that process? So we always tell our, our apprentices to ensure you keep track of your hours because it's your career. It's you know, your goal, your goal to become a licensed electrician as well as ours, but mm -hmm. this is your, your career path. So keep track of your hours. Mm -hmm. So obviously we have the hours that they've worked on the job just mm -hmm. through our accounting software and so forth. So that's, you know, we can check that, but mistakes happen. You know sure. what I mean? You, it's your career. So make sure you keep track of your hours and then we can tell you how many hours you've worked for the company and we can kind of check those side by side. But coincidentally, when it comes to cream, um, we're, he's almost into his second term now. So we're checking his hours. Um, and I was told his hours and I'm like, I don't think that's right. And it's because his co-op hours, he wasn't paid for, oh, okay. they count towards your apprenticeship. So there was 400 hours that would have been not accounted not for counted. if he just counted the, the accounting program Wonderful. and similar when they go to trade school, we don't like have those hours per se, mm -hmm. they're, they're valued at. I think it's 400 or 450 hours, mm -hmm. um, depending on which level you're at. But that's not in our accounting software. So we don't know those hours, right? right? right. So we only know the hours that they've been on the job. We don't know how all the other hours that can also contribute to your apprenticeship to get you through that much faster. Wonderful. So that's really, really good advice. And the other thing is, as an employer, when you sign up uh, an apprentice, um, you can account certain things towards their apprenticeship hours. So you can reduce, uh, so when they come on to the job, they can go from 9,000 down to 8,000 if they meet certain criteria. So uh, usually a high level math will help lower that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a, a science or a physics can help lower those hours so you can get um, credited for those hours as well for your apprenticeship. Oh, that's fantastic. So keeps some really strong bookkeeping is really important. And we yeah. talk about developing professionalism and this idea of, building your portfolio or whatever it is you want to talk about. Is there any opportunity for a co-op student when they're with you to take pictures of their work? They may or may not stay with an employer after the co-op ends, mm -hmm. but if they were really, you know, if the fire has been lit and they know for sure that they want to be a skilled trades person, is there opportunity while they are in a co-op to keep building on their, on their resume skills and, and to kind of have some visuals? Can they take pictures? Is that something yeah. that's um, okay to ask? of an yeah. employer yeah so they're they're more than welcome to take photos so we discourage having phones on them when they're when they're working mm -hmm. um specifically um but you know on their break times or you know maybe just before they go grab their phone and take photos of 
um, whatever they're doing, they're more than welcome to do that unless it's a special project sure. that uh, has sensitive uh, materials in it. But you know, typically they're more than welcome to take photos of, of the work that they do um, just for, you know, bracken rights, mm -hmm. right? Like, look, mm -hmm. I wired this panel or wired this plug. I did this room. You know, you want to keep that. Wonderful. Um, I, I used to say when I had uh, co-op students in my class, you know, it, it's actually can be pretty daunting to pick up your phone and, and make a phone call. And I would always say to my students, but you live on their phone. And they would say, well, we don't we don't use it to phone people. So, you know, sometimes there's a script that can be given to our students at the beginning of the semester, but it is very daunting to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And I would always try and preface their disappointment with, you know, you might have to try more than one employer. So in your experience, Brian, I mean, how... What advice would you have for a young person, even if you weren't able to take them on because you had all of the co-op students that you could, uh, you know, give training for in one semester? What advice would you have for any young person if they if they're turned down? I mean, they know they have the fire, they know what they want to do, but they're not having any luck. Is there any way that they can just keep going, or is there any way that they can bolster that interview process as well? So there everybody's reputation precedes them as the saying goes so okay. you know if you impress one person on one job they might be over here working for somebody else i remember working with that guy or if for example i had a co-op student but i didn't have uh, room for an apprentice mm -hmm. and he was a really good uh, good worker well i know a lot of people in the industry and maybe i'd recommend them right right like it, there's a lot of people that know a lot of people right like you work with a journeyman on a job mm -hmm. you, you know what he's a good kid but we don't have the work for him or or, or whatever the the circumstance sure. may be well that journeyman knows journeyman over there and knows uh, the suppliers over there so there's always you know what good workers will find a spot um and your reputation so if you're showing up every day and you're you know really putting that good good foot forward and somebody sees that they appreciate it and they're going to do their best to help you in some way or another. Um, you don't always know how it's going to go or where what that means, but you, it always comes to, to the surface eventually. That that hard work will, will pay off. And then what I just tell them, if you can't find a placement, go work at a supplier. They're always looking for people as well. Great so if advice. you can't get into a co-op, now you're working at a supplier. You get to learn all the material while you're working for them or doing a co-op placement with them. And guess who you get to meet every day? Right. A whole bunch of tradespeople. Oh, that's excellent. So if advice. you just create a, a good um, attitude when you're communicating with people and they see that in you, they're like, you know what? If you don't want to stay here, you know, delivering materials or, or picking mm -hmm. through materials, come work in the trades with, with me or whatnot. So you know what? Always, always put your best foot forward and it'll pay off for you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Sometimes I would have students say to me, you know, well, what do you mean it's going to take me five years to become a journeyman? And I would say, well, five years is going to go by anyway. So invest in you and you might as well be working towards what your common goals are. We do have some questions that I'd love, I'd love your help in answering. But before we turn to that, Kareem, young people, high school aged, what's your best pro tip or piece of advice for them if they are considering a skilled trades apprenticeship pathway? Apprenticeship pathway? Well, you just said that, uh, they don't want to wait like five years right right but like this is already my first year like going through almost and it's only felt like a month so and it's feel it honestly feels the same way as high school because grade nine from grade 12 was probably the quickest time in your life yes okay it's the exact same Okay, that's great. That's the exact same. Like, I already feel like I'm in grade 10, going into my grade 10 year right now. <laughs> so just go for it. Yeah, just Wonderful. go for it. Just do it. Wonderful. Okay, so we have our chat champions and we have our first question here. Uh, Sarah would like to know, what is a red seal trade? And I'm going to give that one to you, Brian, and then I'm going to try the next one with you, Kareem. <laughs> what is a red seal trade? So that's a tough question, I guess but I'll uh, do my crack at it. Okay. It's, it's a certified trade um, that has specific requirements um, to achieve a red seal. Mm -hmm. So it used to be uh, interprovincial seal, which means you could work all across Canada. And if you got certain marks, you'd get a red seal for, for working across Canada, which is called an interprovincial, or you would just get um, another, like just a, just the license and you could just work in, in one province. Okay. So there's the interprovincial seal, which lets you go across, but now it's, that's all they have. Now there is no, 
just working in one province anymore. So you can work all across Canada with as long as you get your license. So an entirely transferable career. Yeah, across. wonderful. And then um, I believe the Red Seals have certain requirements from a schooling perspective mm -hmm. that you have to achieve in order to get the Red to get the Red Seal trades. Okay, thank you. Great answer. Uh, Benedicta has asked if a student were to get paid for co-op. Will those hours spent working count for volunteer hours? That's a great question, Benedicta. Um, uh, I, I think I'll try and, and answer that from the school board perspective. I love where your thinking is on this one. If a student were to get paid for co-op, will those hours spent working count for volunteer? So to that, I would say no. Um, but what I would say, if you're getting paid, then that is not technically what the volunteer uh, experience is to be. But what I would say is if you are being paid by an employer, you have a strong relationship and they trust you with that, see if you could stick around for an hour or two after you clock out and you can very quickly get your volunteer hours in that way. Uh, Allison, Allison wants to know, um, do you have any advice on how to find an employer who's willing to take on a co-op student? And if it's okay, Kareem, I'm gonna ask that of you because you've had a number of different co-op experiences. So any advice on how you found your employers who would be willing to take on a co-op student? Um, honestly, that was that was all to my teachers. My teachers really helped me at okay. that point. And it all, honestly, it all just took up to me afterwards. So like, oh going having to show up and actually like proving that you're worthy to do it mm -hmm. you just gotta you just gotta get up basically gotta get up yeah get you just going. gotta get up and it's interesting because everyone here has said so many times about strong communication skills and that's why i think it's so so important when you go to a co-op department you introduce yourself you say this is the work that i'm interested in you know your co-op teachers can't help you if they don't have that information so that's that's really good advice if i could add something to please that. so I've had wide range of people reach out to me from parents to co-op teachers to students. Mm -hmm. The best or the most impressive way is for the student to reach out. When the co-op teacher reaches out to, to the employer or the parents, it kind of puts a question in my mind, why is the student not, mm -hmm. does he really want this or he or she really want this? Or is it just something being pushed on them? Or do they not have the ability to communicate to somebody mm -hmm. about the how much they desire to, to get a job. So uh, it, you know, I really highly recommend that the the co-op, the co-op e actually reach out, call and, and really get knock on some doors. Mm -hmm. um, and the more doors you knock on, the more possibilities there are. So you can actually create a demand for yourself by having three people. And then you can actually say, hey, I want to I think I'm going to have the best experience at this placement rather than just take whatever placement is available. So, um, you know, the labor market is is very on the uh, employee side right now. Mm -hmm. There's so much work mm -hmm. out there. So um, go out there and knock on, on a whole bunch. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, employers communicating back. Well, and I, I love that you said that as well, because interviewing is a skill like anything else that you get better at with practice. Interviews can be pretty, uh, they can be a pretty daunting and terrifying experience for me, but the more that you have those, those experiences, uh, the more that you know that you can ask those good questions, that you can bring examples of your work, you can really advocate for yourself with an employer. Uh, I think that that's really, really good messaging for some young people, for sure. Um, Sarah, we've got a question from Sarah, and she is asking, can you count your hours from a previous co-op employer? So I'm going to ask that of you, Brian, because I have you ever had an instance where you had a co-op student who had worked with a previous um, electrician co-op placement prior? And are they able to use those co-op hours with you if you're signing them? Uh, yes, yeah, so we do. Um, we do acknowledge those hours or, or, or consider them. Um, but they just got to be legitimate mm -hmm. um, hours that really contributed to an apprenticeship. Okay. Um, so we can see that. So um, after they've worked for, for a period of time, if they say they have half a year's experience, well, they know what some of the basic materials are. They know how certain basic uh, levels. So we just see where they are in their apprenticeship if, if they really are at that um, mark. So we've had to, you know, apprentices that have come to us and said, oh, I'm a third term apprentice. 
Mm -hmm. um, but yet they have doesn't they don't know how to wire a panel or, or, okay. or something along that nature. So really they're not out of third. They, then when you really dig deep into what they did, well, I swept the shop, I organized materials. So, you, you know, you, the truth comes out um, mm -hmm. with their experience and, and where they are at. But um, most of the time we, we count those hours because most people are honest about what they've done and where they're at. Um, Wonderful. Wonderful. Elaine, you've been my mentor in this process for so, so long, and you have always um, sent the messaging to me and, and to everyone that we're talking to that really apprenticeship is employer driven. And that is, I think that's such a crucial piece in this whole understanding. So thank you for that. Uh, we've got a question from Byrne. And Byrne wants to know how much of a student loan, Kareem, will you have when you finish your apprenticeship? How much of a student loan will you have? Like, do you want to know in total or do you want to know like after the first year of like school? Whatever you're comfortable with divulging, but I think it's important that we touch on the apprenticeship earn while you learn model. So maybe you can speak to that. So I believe it's the first like time you're done school, like the first time you get, I believe it's a thousand. Okay. And then the second time it's another thousand. Amazing. And then third time, I'm not sure if you, I don't, I'm not too sure if you get one. Fourth is when you're going to school to write it, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you're, maybe it's maybe it's three times you get it. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth time you don't get it right off the bat, but once you actually get like, get it, like your actual ticket, then you make 2000 instead. Wow. So you're actually referring to the fact that you will receive grants for successful completion of the different levels yeah. when you go through your so, apprenticeship like training. So like going to school, instead of like, like, yeah, just basically going to school, you're making money getting out of school. Wow. So my daughter is in grade 12 and next year she'll be going to university. And my husband and I are trying to figure out how it is that we're going to be uh, managing what's coming down the financial track for us. Yeah. Um, Kareem, have you had to incur any student debt following the apprenticeship pathway? No, not at all. Not, not at all. all. I, have, I have not. I don't think I've seen my bank account in the negatives at all or anybody else's for me in specifically. That's amazing. Yeah. So you graduated from high school, you went back for your co-op and honed your skills. Yeah. You were hired full time and now you are making money while yeah. you are learning your trade. Yep. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> well done. Well done you. Um, I am not sure. We haven't talked about um, sort of the academic side when you're hiring, what do you look for? You're an employer who looks at high school transcripts. What are you looking for? So the key part is uh, good math marks. So um, the curriculum uh, has college and university. So the stronger the math mark, the better. Um, mostly because it's going to help the student or the co-op or the, the apprentice get through um, the trade schools. So in electrical, there's really high math. Uh, really intense math for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick it up really quickly. So if they have a good math mark from high school, it'll make them more prone to be successful in trade school. Um, if they're really struggling in math, uh, we suggest taking extra courses to pick up on that math. And I've had uh, apprentices take night courses to, to boost that math mark to make it easier for them when they go to trade school. Another course that I look for is uh, physics. Um, that's a really, really good course for construction in general. And then um, I also like tech courses or uh, shop courses, just gets them familiar with how tools work and, and, and the functionality of them. So those are some key, key courses that I look for. And, and English um, is really important as well for, for me, um, just because I like to see good English mark, just because it shows effort. It's gonna set them apart for communication and professionalism. Um, when they have to write something up or, or or hand something in a report of some sort maybe not in their early stages of apprenticeship but later in their apprenticeship or when they're licensed uh, that mark is really going to help them uh, have a step forward so you still need those those good high school marks um, to help make you successful in trade school uh, as well thank you they are called the skilled trades, right? <laughs> yeah. There definitely yeah. is a lot to be learned with that. Uh, Elaine, I'm going to ask you a question if that's all right. And it's come in. We have a question from a guest. My son already works as, uh, in a co-op placement. He'd like to move into an apprenticeship. Does he just ask his current co-op placement if he can be hired as an apprentice? 
once he's an apprentice in high school, does he get paid or does he get paid when he's done high school? Okay. So the first part is he wants to move into an apprenticeship. Does he just ask his current co-op placement? Great. I think I might ask Brian that question, actually. How do you like to see it unfold when the, the individual is wanting that apprenticeship? Um, yeah, so communication with your 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 co-op placement is really important. So asking that, does it look like I'm going to get a placement here? Am I going to be able to be registered when when we're done? Um, and if so, great. If not, okay, why am I not being successful? So um, we try and let the co-op, um, we have to evaluate our co-op uh, placements uh, twice throughout the semester. So we got to let them know that are they doing a good job or what if they're weak somewhere what are they weak in and, and how can they improve just like any anybody would want to know if they're being if they're doing well or not um so just communicate with your your employer say hey am i going to get registered maybe he doesn't have room or she doesn't have room for you um in the apprenticeship because they they have their numbers um say okay do you do you see me getting registered later or do you know anybody um, after this co-op placement's done that I could be registered with, can you make any recommendations? Mm -hmm. Again, that communication is important. Don't wait till the very last day and then find out, oh, I've been doing a horrible job all co-op. I should have been doing this instead of that or, right. or whatnot. And then, then you can start planning, hey, if I'm not going to get registered here, can you write a letter saying I've done however many hours? And then you can take that to the next employer. Now you have some experience to show the next employer, hey, I've done 300 hours with XYZ. Can you count those towards my apprenticeship when you register me or when you hire me? Mm -hmm. um, it just shows now you have some experience, you kind of got that leg up on somebody that's maybe brand new. Those hours might not be a ton of hours, but there's something and something's better than nothing. I've got a question from Lydia and she's wondering, are there many females in electrical apprenticeships? So I'd love to say there is a lot, um, but no, there isn't. There hasn't been a lot. I've noticed the numbers have been growing. Um, over the last just a few years, we've started to see um, more females apply mm -hmm. um, into the trade, which is great. And we've actually hired um, two females um, to the company. So that's been you know great. Um, but there's there's lots of room room for a lot more women in the trades. Um, we haven't we see them on various uh, certain trades, carpentry. We've seen we've seen some. Um, Laborers, we've seen some mm -hmm. and electrical, mm -hmm. but there's a, quite a few trades that we haven't seen any um, get into. So, you know what? The, there's so many opportunities out there, and um, you know, there, there's a lot of room for women in the trade, and they're, they've been quite successful. The ones that have been working for us have been uh, quite successful. Oh, that's excellent. And what I love about skilled trades work is it, it's the work that speaks for itself. So, I yep. think that's a really, really important point. Uh, Chase wants to know how apprenticeships have been affected by the pandemic in terms of, I, I guess, all of it, you know, the number of jobs that are coming in, what the interaction is like on the, on the job sites. How has the workday for you, Karim, um, been impacted by the pandemic? Um, I haven't, it, it hasn't really affected me at all. Like, like, yeah, I know it's still there, but like, it honestly just feels like a regular day at work. It's all it really feels like. It's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe like right at the start, like it was kind of just like more cautious about it and they're putting it down on us more. Sure. But like, other than that, like they would do like rapid tests all the time and all that. Mm -hmm. But like now it's just like wear a mask in the building. Mm -hmm. and just do your work but, you. and like when you're by yourself you can take it off if you're mm -hmm. in a unit by yourself but other than that like it's hasn't it hasn't been really that bad like okay. it hasn't really changed anything okay it's, yeah that's great and for yourself brian have you seen has the work slowed has it picked up what's your experience been so we've been just as busy as ever um the pandemic has just changed the way uh some of the safety protocols that we need to follow on sites um, some of the safety procedures we need to we needed to implement, mm -hmm. um, but from a work perspective, we were fortunate in the construction industry to uh, keep working through the pandemic. Um, we were able to uh, still uh, work safely mm -hmm. um, with the type of work that we do. A lot of it is outside, very airy areas. You can maintain your distance, but it's just the safety protocols that have really just changed um, 
the industry in, in a sense. We have to wear our masks, sanitize, sure. but that's changed to every industry. So everyone's mm -hmm. doing those sort of things. But from um, a work perspective, the work has been roaring through just um, throughout wow. the whole industry and we were able to look forward as well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Christina. Should a student look to complete their apprenticeship hours before going to trade school or vice versa? And someone to speak a little bit to that. Or maybe you can talk about how they actually complement each other. So they can't complete hours all at once previous before going to trade school. Okay. And they can't go to school um, prior to completing all their work hours. They kind of got to work hand in hand in order to be successful mm -hmm. so they got to work on the job site uh, for a year and then they get an offer to go to school then they work for a year go to school work for a year go to school because they need the on-site training sure. um, to really understand some of the school parts of it so if you just went into school school and just tried to learn it you'd be like there'd be a lot of gaps that you wouldn't understand or, or be able to visualize um like what do you mean run a wire through this or do some you wouldn't be able to understand it without being on a job site so they complement hand in hand. Um, I always recommend get a placement, get it a get registered with a company, work your one year, go to school, and work your way through. If you're really struggling to find a, a placement, there are court there are uh, classes that you can take to help put give you a leg up to get that placement. Mm -hmm. But the key part is to just get that placement. So you just gotta bang on a lot of doors and just mm -hmm. uh, you know get that placement, and then. Um, you're off to the races, but you got to do it in the order that they, they have set out. They've perfected um, the training program. They've perfected the, the process with going to school or working, go to school, working, go to school, and you just follow it through. Okay. So I like that. We talked about, I would say it's roughly 80% on the job, 20% is in school. And I mean, yeah. Elaine, you, you've taught me as well that the idea is that the theory is then being you're able to put that into practice, which is really yep. excellent. Got a great question from Cody, uh, who wants to know, how do we find a co-op placement and will there be transportation? So if I may, I might just answer that one. With regards to finding a co-op placement, I always say to students, do your research, come to co-op on, on the first day of semester with a nice strong idea of where it is that you would like to work and what kind of work you would like to do. If you don't have any idea, you can certainly uh, be using the career exploration tools that your schools have available for you. And you can start your search with, what are the activities that I like to do? Where am I strong? You know, what are the things that really, really um, get that fire in me going? And I feel good when I'm doing the work. With regards to transportation, um, normally what happens is the students come to the school, they check in with their co-op teachers, the attendance is taken, and then you're put into some form of transportation that can get you to the job site. So when I was a co-op teacher, I would put the students into cabs every single day. And that the cab was, was really a nice time because the kids would all leave me. But before that, we would have an opportunity to check Check in, how's your day going? And away you go. But Brian, you and I have talked a number of times about how if you are going to be in the trades, you've got to have some transportation. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. What are some of the challenges if you're in high school uh, without your own set of wheels and you're wanting to break into the trades? What time does the day start and those kinds of things? Please. So typically, depending on, on where the location is, you leave anywhere between 5.30 to 6.30 in the morning. Um, and you're going for your job day anywhere between eight to 10 hours, and then you're, you're going home. So those are, can be some long days. Um, but with the construction industry, you're not always in the same job all the time. You mm -hmm. might be working mm -hmm. in Midland one day, downtown Barry another, um, or really another day, or one week in each or, or so forth. So you, the, 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 the uh, Brutus honest truth is, you're going to need to get some wheels to get to the job sites right. um, in time. Um, we've had a co-op placement that had his parents drop him off every morning at 530 at the carpool in Barrie. And uh, he went to the job site and he got picked up every day. He didn't have his own set of wheels, but uh, he, I think he has it now actually. Wow. Um, so the, the honest truth is you're going to need to get some wheels. The school can help get you to and from for during your co-op, but then what do you do after that co-op placement? Mm. Right. So the key part is, you know, get that G2 license, get your license. Don't procrastinate, which uh, a lot of people I've noticed are procrastinating getting that license, get that license and get your career off with uh, as quickly as possible, because you can get licensed as early as 22 to 23 years old. You're a licensed journey person. 
so get those uh get the g2 and you're gonna have to get a set of wheels eventually wow and you know what kareem you talked about that grant that you're eligible to receive once yeah. you successfully complete your level one your two and your c of q yeah. so it might be a good opportunity for you to buy some wheels with oh, that yeah, uh, sure. that apprentice yeah. incentive grant so we are coming to a close of our evening and i certainly want to say thank you to everyone so much for being here elaine this was an incredible idea brian as always your support uh, of our students is without parallel we absolutely love it and cream the best part of our day is when we get to, to talk with young people who have found their way in the trades yeah. so yeah. most certainly we want to say thank you so so much uh, my name is stacy hinton this is elaine mclaughlin you can absolutely be in touch with us um, through our school boards our emails mine is shinton at smcdsb.on.ca and elaine i'll turn it over to you to give your email thank you my email is the letter E for Elaine and my last name is M-C-L-A-C-H-L-I-N at Simcoe County District School Board dot on dot C-A. Wonderful. But, Thank uh, you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.